I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 90. Now, I said a few days ago when I put up episode 89 that I try to do a little better in terms of waiting such a long time between episodes. So here I am just a few days later coming through with my commitment. And the subject of this podcast is Marshall McLuhan and the Kindle. Now, I've written a few articles in the past year about this subject, and I'll be posting links to them all over the place after they're published, including on the podcast page for this episode. But I thought as a good prelude to those articles, I do a little podcast on the subject. Now, obviously, the Kindle didn't exist when Marshall McLuhan was writing. But one of the things I pointed out in many of my articles and book about Marshall McLuhan is that he was really writing more about our time than the time in which he lived. So, for example, one of McLuhan's most famous observations is that electronic media are turning the world into a global village. He wrote that back in 1962 in his book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. But back in 1962, the biggest audience any television show would have was a national audience. So there was really no international or global audience. And not only that, the audience was not interactive. It was an audience of voyeurs. Unlike a village in which anyone in a village can not only listen and see what's going on, they can also be part of the conversation. And it wasn't until the advent of social media, or what I call new, new media in the 21st century. I call them new, new because unlike iTunes and most of Amazon, where in order to get a book online, in the case of Amazon, or a song online, you have to have a publisher, which is really the traditional mode of publishing. But unlike those media, social media like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, made everyone a producer. And so for the first time, there was not only a global village, but it was truly interactive. But Amazon went one big step further when it created the Kindle and, in particular, allowed anyone to upload a story, a novel, and therein become a publisher. Now, when I was writing the preface to Marshall McLuhan's Laws of the Media back in 1977, I was immediately struck by his observation that, this is a quote, Quote, the Xerox makes everyone a publisher. And I remember thinking, would that this were true? Now, I of course knew what McLuhan meant. Anyone could walk into a Xerox shop and make as many copies as they wanted of a manuscript. But I also knew full well that this was not quite publishing, not by a long shot. Because, after all, the photocopied manuscript looked nothing like a book didn't look like a hardcover, it didn't look like a paperback either, and you were unlikely to ever find it for sale in any bookstore. But McLuhan was nonetheless on to something as he was in everything he wrote, just as he was when he talked about the global village, because he had captured in that comment, the Xerox makes everyone a publisher, he had captured in that observation the need of almost every author not only to write, but to publish, to bring that writing to the attention of the world at large. And if the Xerox did not quite do that, it was indeed the beginning of a series of media developments that did, and which would culminate with the Kindle in our own time. So again, as with so much else of what McLuhan wrote, he was really looking at what was going on in the 21st century, not back in the 1950s, 60s, or 1970s. Now, getting back to every writer wanting to be a publisher, I suppose there may be some other writers who, like Emily Dickinson, 
submitted just a sliver of her great output of poetry for publication. But you know, I've never met any, and the prospect of writing for my file cabinet or private computer screen is antithetical to every authorial impulse of my being. The act of writing, I would therefore contend, is intrinsically an act of publishing. Why write something if you don't want people to read it? But submitting for publication is not easy, and the talent of getting published, aside from the quality of the writing, has little in common with the talent of writing. The result is, as Thomas Gray put it, in his elegy written in a country churchyard back in 1751. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. So I think Thomas Gray really captured the fate of many writers, many authors, perhaps, in fact, the vast majority of authors prior to the Kindle. Because the problem for an unpublished author resides in the logic of the acquisitions editor. If your work is accepted for publication and it does not do well, the editor looks bad. But if your work is accepted by no one for publication, No one even knows it exists, and no one looks bad. In fact, even if someone else publishes a book rejected by an acquisitions editor, and that book does do well, few people will know about the earlier editor's poor judgment. Science fiction writer Robert A. Heinlein's advice to authors to keep sending out a work until someone publishes it was the best that an author could do under the traditional gatekeeping regime. But it provided no assurance that a great work, yours, would not be left to blush unseen. This is why the Kindle revolution is such a profound game changer for the author, and it's what changed Amazon from a new medium into a new new medium. Because at any point in the dance of sending out your work for publication to the next publisher, you can stop the dance and publish the work yourself. Or you don't have to dance in the first place. You can publish your book on Amazon. You can also publish your book on Nook, Kobo, iTunes, and other digital sites. And you can do this almost the moment you finish writing it. All that is needed is a conversion of your doc or PDF file into a Mobi file suitable for the Kindle or an EPUB file suitable for Nook and the rest and a suitable digital cover. And by the way, you can download a free app for your iPhone, iPad, laptop, pretty much any computer. So you don't even need a Kindle or a Nook device to read these electronic books. Now, digital publication works not only for self-publication, but publication by small presses, and for that matter, by traditional publishers as well. My 1999 book, Digital McLuhan, was published by Routledge, a traditional publisher in England, and they, a few years ago, came out with a Kindle edition of that book. So this invites a comparison of each kind of publication for authors in today's world. In other words, what are the advantages of traditional publication on a Kindle or anywhere versus a publication on the Kindle either by you or a small press that probably wouldn't have existed had it not been for the Kindle opportunity? Well, the awards of traditional publication to an author are pretty much common knowledge. You get advances, These can be huge if you're a best-selling author, but they're usually in the four or five figures, especially for scholarly texts. You get copy editing and proofreading. The traditional publisher arranges for your book cover, gets books into bookstores, at least you hope so, as well as on Amazon. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll get some small bit of advertising and promotion. 
that you usually have to beg for. The drawbacks of traditional publishing are perhaps not as well known. Minuscule royalties, usually 10% of net sales or even less. A delay in receiving such royalties, usually at least six months to a year or longer. Complex royalty statements, which would give even your accountant a splitting headache. Needing to plead for promotion. All capped off by a steep decline in your publisher's interest in your book within about a month after publication. Unless, again, it's a bestseller an immediate bestseller. Because if it isn't, it's not going to become a bestseller and it will barely be available and certainly not known to the public. A small or independent press removes those disadvantages. You can negotiate a much better royalty, receive your payments on a monthly basis, and expect continuing promotion and interest in your book as long as the small press endures. True, You won't get much, if any, advance. You might have to find or arrange for your own cover, and you may need to call upon family and friends for help with copy editing, but not having to beg for promotion is a big plus. And if we're talking about digital publication, physical bookstores are irrelevant. My wife and kids have helped with crucial copy editing and proofreading of all of my books, including the many that have been traditionally published. Well, what about sales? I've sold far more copies of my novels, The Silk Code and The Plot to Save Socrates, in the past year in their digital editions, brought out by small press Josara Media, than in the previous six years of all editions brought out by my traditional publisher, Tor, after the book's initial sales bumps in the first few months of their publication, back in 1999 and 2006. That's 1999 for the Silk Code, 2006 for the Plot to Save Socrates. Well, what about digital self-publishing in comparison to small independent publication? This has the advantage of keeping all control in the author's hands, including immediate publication and all income from sale of the book. That's nice. But I chose Josara Media rather than self-publication, mainly to share my workload. Otherwise, I'd self-publish in a heartbeat. And I work well with Josara Media. Larry Ketcherson and Audrey Ketcherson, who is their company, are just great people to work with. And we were friends long before they published my Kindle editions. Now, there is one exception to the advantage of a Kindle publication uh, or publication by either self-publication or a small press on Kindle in contrast to traditional publishing. There is one kind of publishing in which traditional publishing still has a very significant edge. That would be in textbooks, where traditional publishers have sales forces who can get books to the attention of professors who order textbooks for their classes. Pearson, the publisher of my new new media, now in its second edition, has done a good job with this. But the drawbacks in terms of pleading for promotion and so forth remain and make even textbook publishers vulnerable to the Kindle revolution. The upshot is that the fulfillment of McLuhan's vision in our digital age has set the world of writing and publishing on a course as revolutionary as the printing press and the alphabet were in their originating times. Now, a frequent criticism of this new age is that, without traditional publishers, who will decide if a book is worthy? My answer? The people. The author enjoys a direct, unmediated relationship with every potential reader. And it's important to bear in mind that some of the great works, not only in writing but in music, all kinds of things, were turned down by numerous publishers, gatekeepers. It stunned me when I found out that 25 record companies turned down the Beatles. Imagine that, 25 tone-deaf A&R people in record companies passed on the Beatles. And almost as many turned down Dune which was the beginning of the great Frank Herbert series in science fiction. So, 
I think we've lived for too long in a world in which a small group of people decide what the rest of us can read and hear in the case of music. And the Kindle and its fulfillment of Marshall McLuhan's idea of the Xerox turning everyone into a publisher is indeed something which I think will serve the human species in good stead in the years and centuries ahead. The Light on Light Through podcast. Well, hey, I just want to let you know that if you were interested in seeing some of the Kindle editions of the books I mentioned in the podcast, my science fiction novels, Digital McLuhan, you can find them on the web page for this podcast. Just go to lightonlightthrough.com. And I'll be back here soon with another podcast, another episode of Light on Light Through. In the meantime, enjoy. Athens. 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. Paul Levinson still code about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries.